things like medicine. You can see this from the way the Buddha taught. It starts off with the Four Noble Truths, which are very much like an analysis of how to care for a disease, the diseases of the mind. In this case, it's the suffering that comes from craving, suffering that comes from ignorance. That's what we've got to cure. And so he analyzes the symptoms of the disease, he diagnoses it, explains its causation, discusses what it's like to be free of the disease, and then shows the way to the path of treatment that leads to the end of the disease, leads to a state of health. So it's important to keep this in mind as we stay here in practice. We're working on the diseases of our own minds. Each of us has sicknesses. And all of the, the basic outlines of the sickness are the same, craving, ignorance. Our cravings are different. Our particular brands of ignorance are different as well. This is why we have to make allowances for each other, because different people have to underco undergo different courses of treatment. It's like when you go into the hospital. It's not like everybody in the, throughout the hospital has the same diseases. Some people have cancer, some people have heart diseases, some people have liver diseases. Some people have diseases from eating too much, other people have diseases from eating too little. There are all kinds of different diseases in the hospital. And it's the same way here in the monastery. Each of us has our own particular diseases. And our duty here is to take care of our diseases and not pick up diseases from other people. And at the same time, not get upset that somebody else is taking a different kind of medicine than you are. Each of us has our own diseases, so it requires a specific medicine. Some medicines are bitter and unpleasant to take. Other medicines are a lot easier to take. So each of us has his or her own course of treatment. So it's important that we pay attention to our own treatment and not worry about the treatment of others. And if some people don't seem to be recovering from their diseases as fast as you'd like them to, well, that, again, that's their disease. So try to keep this in mind. Remember what John Lee says, when you look inside, it's the Dharma. When you look outside, it's the world. And it's not just the world that you look at. Your whole mind becomes the world as well when you start focusing outside. This person does that. That person does this. That's the world. Even if you use the categories of the Dharma to judge this person, judge that person, ultimately what it comes down to is you've taken the Dharma and you've turned it into the world. So you've got to keep your gaze focused inside. So in other words, when you get upset at someone else, okay, what is this quality of being upset? Focus on that. It's the events in the mind that are important. Those are the ones that are causing you your own illness. And there's a question of whether you're trying to cure your illness or whether these, some of these events tend to aggravate the illness. So keep this point in mind as you practice. As we live together, we see each other a lot. But try to make that have the least impact as possible on the mind. You want to turn your gaze inside. Even when you're looking outside, you want your focus to be inside. How is your mind reacting to this? How is your mind reacting to that? This is part of restraint of the senses. Several years back, we had a woman who was here very serious about how she was going to practice restraint of the senses. And then she overheard other people talking about her, saying that she was being kind of stuck up and unfriendly because she was trying to be so quiet. And so she came to me to complain about how other people were not respecting her restraint of the senses. Of course, what kind of restraint is that, and getting upset about what other people are saying about you? The restraint is a purely an internal matter. So even though you have to see things, hear things, smell things, taste things, touch things, think about things, okay, don't make those things your main focus. It's the process of how the mind reacts to the seeing, how the mind directs the seeing, and so on with the other senses. 
And if some issues come up and the, the illness in the mind gets aggravated, how are you going to deal with it? We've got all these tools that the Buddha laid out, all these medicines that he laid out, the Chan and the 32 parts of the body. That's basically a reminder of these tools for dealing with lust. The Chan on the four sublime attitudes. That's for dealing not only with anger, but lots of other things. Jealousy, any cruel intentions in your mind, any tendency to get worked up about things that are totally beyond your control. There are antidotes for these diseases. And our duty here is to take them, to use them. Because after all, who's suffering because of our diseases? Well, other people are suffering to some extent, but we're really suffering. We suffer very little from what other people do, and we suffer a great deal from the lack of skill in our own minds. But at one point talks about craving, conceit, and attachment. Our attachment, this is the way that person should be, that's the way that person should be. Some people interpret this as being attached to a particular path. Well, you have to be attached to the path. But when you're attached to your ideas of judging other people, you have to ask yourself, hey, wait a minute, am I at the National Bureau of Standards? Those are the kinds of attachments you want to let go. Craving, the desire to be this way, things have to be that way, you want them to be this way, and when they aren't then the way with the way you want them to be. This is a very important lesson I learned with John Fuhrman. It always seemed that the times when he was sick were extremely inconvenient for me. I had some project going on, maybe it was a translation project or something that I had to work on around the monastery. It always seemed just as I was really getting into the project, oh, I got sick. I had to drop everything. I began to, notice, began to notice a sense of frustration, finally realized, hey, wait a minute. If I let go of that desire to be focused on that project, things go a lot more easily. If I let go of my desire for him to care for his illness in a particular way that I thought was best. Well, it made things a lot easier around the monastery, and especially for me, and for him as well. And so when you start running into that, that reality, okay, your cravings are the things that are making you suffer. Okay, so those are the things you've got to let go of. And then you find you can live with all kinds of situations. Not that you become lazy, just sort of letting things be whatever way they want to be. You learn to be selective. Okay, where can you make a difference? Where can you not make a difference? Where is your craving helping you in the path? Where is your craving getting in the way? You have to learn how to be selective. Learn to be skillful. And where you direct your wants, where you direct your aspirations. And again, the problem is not so much outside, the problem is inside. We do suffer just from some extent to things outside, but the reason we suffer is because things inside are not skillful. And that's what we have to work on. Once the inside problem is dealt with, okay, the outside things just don't touch us at all. Conceit is another troublemaker. Conceit is not just sort of puffing yourself up and thinking you're better than other people. The Buddha finally came down to saying it's it's the tendency of the mind to compare itself with other people. Even if you say, I'm worse than that other person, yet there's conceit there. There's an I in there. The I-making, mind-making, and the tendency to conceit. We would say, that's a lot of problems right there. Major cause of diseases. He talks about the sense of I am as the really basic cause for the mind's tendency to proliferate ideas, its tendency to make differentiations, to complicate things. And all the categories that come with those complications, it all starts from this I am. It's also the basic verbalization of craving. It starts with the I am and then it goes to I was, I will be, or am I, am I not? And all these other questions that come up around this whole concept of putting the I and the M together, and then identifying with them. And then you start comparing this I am to other people's, your sense of what they are. And so either 
you're better than they are, or you're equal to them, or you're worse than they are, and it's just a big troublemaker all around. Just keep remembering, okay, their diseases are their diseases. They've got to cure them. They've got to take the medicine. Your disease is yours. That's your prime responsibility. And if the, people, the person next to you in the hospital, <coughs> hospital room is not taking his medicine properly, well, okay, that's his problem. You can be helpful and encourage him, but there comes a point where you have to say, okay, that's his issue. I've got my own disease to take care of. And this way, it's a lot easier for all of us when these attachments and these cravings and these conceits don't get in the way. Any place you practice becomes an ideal place to practice. People often ask, where is the best place to practice? Well, the best place to practice, of course, is right here in the here and now. It's actually the only place you can practice. But you can do things to make it the here and now a better place wherever you are. It's dependent not so much on changing things outside, but it's changing your inner attitudes. And that way this becomes a good place to practice for all of us.